Well, welcome to our service. And today we're embarking on a new format for some of our services because this is the first in a new series entitled The A to Z of Non-Subscribing Presbyterianism. So each week we'll look at a different item or a different idea, a different thing connected to our churches and see what that tells us about our identity, our history and ethos. I'll try and avoid the approach that looks at historical personages and concentrates on individuals. However, I will have to make an exception for this, the first in the series, because today's subject for the letter A is John Abernethy. Now, you can't really study non-subscribing Presbyterianism without mentioning John Abernethy. In the days when we had Sunday school games and they included a quiz, the senior section always included a question for the children of over 14. The question was, who is known as the father of non-subscription? And the answer was John Abernethy. He is seen really as the, the real founder of, if not this denomination, then this way of thinking uh, within the Presbyterian churches in Ireland. He is worth studying, he is worth remembering. He's a very important figure in, uh, in Irish history uh, and certainly in Irish religious history and the history of Presbyterianism. Now, John Abernethy was born in County Tyrone in 1680. His father was a Presbyterian minister there. He'd come over from Scotland and had settled as a minister. And he grew up in a time, you can imagine, in the 1680s of extreme disorder. And in 1689, his father had gone to London to lobby the new king, King William III, uh, on behalf of the Presbyterians. And while, um, while he was in London, Abernethy's mother and all his siblings took refuge in Derry. They were there for the siege and all of his brothers and sisters died in the siege of Derry. He survived because he'd been sent to a different relative in Ballymena. So the start of his life was really quite a tragic one and quite a difficult one. Uh, but he proved himself uh, to be a very able person. He went off to Glasgow to read for a degree in the University of Glasgow, a not uncommon thing for Presbyterian ministers at the time, and followed that up by going to Edinburgh to read divinity before entering the ministry. Now, John Abernethy was a very able minister. He received a number of calls, but accepted the one from the congregation in Antrim in 1703. Now, Abernethy ministered in Antrim for the best part of 30 years. But this was a very tumultuous time for Presbyterians in Ireland, and Abernethy was really at the centre of the problems that Presbyterians faced. And he was at the centre of these, these issues because of his principles. And I'd like to suggest that there were three sort of guiding principles to his life, uh, which were important to him, which were important in those days, and which are still important today. And uh, we'll look at those briefly. There is more detail uh, on John Abernethy in the, the videos that you can see uh, that I've already done on, on the history of the denomination. But to briefly look at Abernethy's life, I would say he was characterised really by, by three principles. Uh, the first was his deep spiritual commitment. There's no doubt that he did have this very deep faith, this very deep commitment which was similar in some ways to traditional Puritan faith, 
but also enlightened at this period, just at the start of the Enlightenment itself, enlightened by this desire uh, to employ reason in the realm of religion. And allied to that, the second principle was an extraordinary independence of mind. And this was bolstered by really having the most superior intellect uh, of, of anybody within his orbit at the time. And his, his uh, published books on philosophy became the standard textbooks for the universities in Scotland and also the dissenting academies in England. He was that important as a writer and philosopher. And thirdly, he also had a great concern for the advancement of the Presbyterian religion. Uh, he believed in the Presbyterian system and he believed in promoting it. So I don't think he would have been glad to see the divisions that resulted in all these issues being worked out in the early 18th century. Well, first of all, he was a person of great spiritual depth. And one of the great losses to history is his six-volume spiritual diary has been lost. Now, this was used by his biographer in the 1740s and his successor in Antrim, the Reverend James Duckle. And he had sight of, of these volumes and said there were some interesting things in there. And the interesting, another interesting thing about his diaries is that although no one has definitely seen them since the 1740s, someone writing in the 1880s claimed to have sight of them. Someone else has told me more recently that they have seen them hidden away. And there is this belief that somehow or other these have been concealed um, from uh, historians somehow or somewhere. I'm not sure whether that's true, but it still is possible that his diaries exist and they might yet come to light. And they would tell us a lot about the way a leading minister thought and prayed and acted, as well also as what exactly happened in the events leading up to the, the uh, first subscription controversy. One aspect of his ministry in Antrim was that he was an Irish speaker. Uh, he's not listed in the Presbyterian Church's lists of, of Irish speaking ministers at the time and there was a great concern within the Synod of Ulster uh, to have ministers trained in Irish to go out and preach in Irish. But Abernethy could do this anyway and when he was in Antrim he went uh, about the, 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 the villages and the townlands around the shores of Loch Ney and seems to have had a great impact on the people who lived there, who would be from a Catholic background, and he seemed to have a great connection with them. And when in 1717 and 1718 the General Synod tried to move John Abernethy from Antrim to Dublin, there's a very interesting account of the Synod meeting where a delegation from uh, the shores of Loch Ney, these people from the shores of Loch Ney came to the Synod and put in a plea to ask the Synod not to move John Abernethy away from his ministry in Antrim. And they came and spoke in Irish and the, the Synod had to find people who could translate what they wanted to say. So we've got this spiritual depth, we've also got this independence of mind, an independence that resisted the attempts by the Synod to move him on, on a number of occasions. They wanted him to move to Dublin because he was so able, so uh, scholarly, so well equipped uh, as a speaker and writer. They wanted him to be in Dublin where he could be of use uh, in Presbyterian representations to government. But he refused to leave Antrim. So there's uh, those, those two things. And also a desire to, to see Presbyterian church life Flourish. He was moderator of the General Synod. But when he reflected uh, on the, the nature of scripture and the nature of faith and the place of reason, he increasingly came into conflict with the old guard. And this caused considerable uh, friction within the church, particularly after 1719, when he published his famous sermon. On religious obedience, 
founded on personal persuasion. And Abernethy was at the forefront of a new type of thinking that laid great stress on the individual's right to make up their own minds, to not be told what to believe, but to decide for themselves, and to use reason uh, as, as a, a, an additional pillar to their faith. So this was the important key issue in the 1720s, and it led to the separation of the Presbytery of Antrim from the Synod of Ulster. I think Abernethy was aggrieved by these divisions. And a few years after that, he did move to Dublin, but to a different church than the one the, 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 the Synod had insisted he go to before. He moved to Wood Street, which was uh, of a more liberal uh, tradition within Dublin. And he went there and was able uh, to express Presbyterian views and to express them in a more uh, liberal uh, way. And he died in 1740. So this is a brief overview of the life of John Abernethy. It really doesn't do him justice. But he was such a towering figure in his day, uh, such a dominant figure, and one uh, who put forward arguments and ideas that were crucial to the development of our denomination, but crucial to to the development of thought within the Protestant churches. So we remember him today, and we remember him with thanksgiving. And for the letter A, we have to start with Abernethy. So here he is, John Abernethy. So thinking of John Abernethy, let's read from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14, verses 5 to 9. It's the passage which Abernethy used in his famous sermon of 1719. Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honour of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honour of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honour of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. And here ends our reading. Well, let's join together now in the fellowship of prayer. Let us pray. Remembering all the witnesses and martyrs of the faith and all who have given their lives for God, we offer up our prayers of thanks for those who have gone before. Let us pray for one another, for our communities, for our churches and for all churches and for all who seek to do the will of God. We ask for God's guidance and support in our work. We offer up our prayers for the world and for all those known to us in need of solace and support and healing. As we pray, we ask for God's blessing upon us. As we join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught when he spoke of God as our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. 
آمد.